All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we are excited to be here today with with Deborah Marquardt. Um, we've got uh, a fun workshop after a fun week, um, and what we've got uh, is Deborah's. Received uh, honors for her work. She's got some fantastic books. Uh, first ran across for her with uh, From Sweetness, which is a fantastic work. Um, you can see a little bit more about her, but she's won a push Pushcart Prize and she's been teaching at the Stone Coast uh, residency this week and she teaches at Iowa State University. So, with that, I am uh, going to turn things over to Deborah. All right, thank you so much, Matt and Gina, for organizing this. I'm so, I'm so happy to be part of this. And it's great to see all of you. I can kind of see first names and things like that. Um, so I understand you've been doing this all week, is that right? Yep. How many, um, are there any people who are just new today who haven't been part of this in the last few days? Okay, so um, I sort of planned this out so that um, if you haven't been participating all week, it shouldn't be an issue. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a map of what we'll do today, um, I'm going to read a few poems and um, just talk about writing in general, kind of a little bit about how I came to writing. And then um, I'm going to give you a prompt and give you a little time to write. I'll talk a little bit about free writing too, because maybe not everybody's familiar with the idea of free writing. Um, and then I'll give you time to write and then we'll come back. If you feel like sharing uh, or talking through what you got from the prompt, that'll be fine. And if not, I, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna put anybody on the psychiatrist couch because I made you, I made you share. So um, I personally am not like a really great in, you know, in person kind of, writer when I'm in the presence of other people. I tend to write more in the middle of the night. So I totally understand if you don't want to share. So um, I can just start by, you know, by saying I'm Deb Marquardt. I, I grew up in North Dakota and um, I grew up, my, my grandparents were immigrants. I grew up in an ethnic enclave in North Dakota, a very rural part of the state. The whole state is rural. So, um, and, and uh, I never, <laughs> I never knew there were writers. Um, I, I never heard of such a thing until I went to college. And I remember walking home from my freshman English class and my teacher had written um, that I could be a writer in the notes. And I remember walking to my dorm and thinking, a writer? Like, what do writers do? You know, it just didn't make any sense to me. I thought all the books were written. They were all written by, by white men. I thought that all the dead, the white men who wrote the books were all dead. And I thought now it was just up to us to just read these books, you know, for the rest of our lives. And so this will strike you as extremely naive. I, I was, I mean, I just realized, oh my God, the stuff that I know about that only I know about can be put into books. And so uh, that kind of started my writing, my writing and recording journey. But what really, um, caused it to go into a different sort of a different level was when I lost everything in a fire. I was a road musician for many years and my band lost everything in a truck fire. And in one night we lost $60,000 worth of equipment in a truck, in a gas fire with a truck. And, and the next day I woke up and I realized that I was going to have to put my energy into something that I thought was a little more durable. And for me, writing became very durable. Poems, poems last, books last, stories last, they go on, people tell them. Um, so I thought I'd read you a few poems that are kind of part of this, this idea that um, poems last. And what I'd like you to do is, if you have a piece of paper kind of by your, by your side where you're sitting, um, whenever I teach creative writing class, I like to use my own work to talk about what makes um, what makes vivid writing. So vivid writing is drawn from sensory detail, obviously, sight, smell, taste, touch, sound. Um, it was William Carlos Williams who said, no ideas, but in things. So, you know, uh, we have a strong imperative to, to bring the sensory detail to the page in order to bring the reader into the experience. So 
I'm going to read this poem that I think has got quite a bit of sensory detail in it. And then after I'm done reading it, I'd just like you to um, say back to me any details or put them in the chat um, in the chat window if you don't want to talk. Any details that particularly jumped out and were memorable. And this is called, um, well, this is, a, this is a little story that was in my family for many years. It was about when my older sister Judy blew out the ceiling of my brother's bedroom with a shotgun. This was a, this was a little family story. It could have been a catastrophe, obviously. It ended up just being one of those family stories um, about this strange thing that happened. So this is called, um, Kablooey is the sound you'll hear. Kablooey is the sound you'll hear, then plaster falling and the billow of gypsum after your sister blows a hole in the ceiling of your brother's bedroom with the shotgun he left loaded and resting on his dresser. It's Saturday and the men are in the fields. You and your sister are cleaning house with your mother. Maybe your sister hates cleaning that much, or maybe she's just that thorough. But somehow she has lifted the gun to dust it or dust under it. You are busy mopping the stairs. And from the top landing where you stand, you turn toward the sound to see your sister cradling the smoking shotgun in her surprised arms, like a beauty queen clutching a bouquet of long stemmed roses after being pronounced the official winner. Then the smell of burnt gunpowder reaches you, dirty orange and sulfurous, like spent fireworks. And through the veil of smoke, you see a hole smoldering above her head, a halo of perforations in the ceiling, the drywall blown clean through insulation to the naked joists, that dark constellation where the buckshot spread. The look on your sister's face is pure shit-faced shock. You'd like to stop and photograph it for blackmail or for future family stories, but now you must focus on the face of your mother, frozen there at the base of the steps, where she has rushed from vacuuming or waxing, her frantic eyes searching your face for some clue about the extent of the catastrophe. But it's like that heavy quicksand dream where you can't move or speak. So your mother scrambles up the stairs on all fours, rushes past you to the room where your sister has just now found her voice, already screaming her story. It just went off. It just went off as if a shotgun left to rest on safety would rise and fire itself. All this will be hashed and rehashed around the supper table, but what stays with you all these years later, what you cannot forget, is that moment when your mother waited at the bottom of the steps for a word from you, one word, and all you could offer her was silence. Okay, so it's quite a story. <laughs> um, so where would you like to start? Were there any details? And you can go, I, you can go ahead and turn your mics on and, and, um, and say whatever you'd like. Uh, were there any particular details? Yes, uh, Gina, did you raise your hand? I was actually applauding. Um, oh, oh that's a, a little okay, tiny that's emoji. <laughs> okay, I thought that was a hand raise. Okay. Yeah, Amy, go ahead. Yeah. Two things. Um, the dirty orange and sulfurous smell is mm -hmm. wonderful. And the second one, the scrambles up the stairs on all fours. I mean, yeah. That is just, it lingers. Yeah, I meant that to almost look like a kind of animal gesture, you know, but she was so frantic. Um, rushes past me on all fours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? I love that um, she was holding the gun in her arms like a beauty queen holding roses. Clutching a bouquet of long roses after being pronounced the official winner. You know that look um, that, I mean, it, it's just like, you know how this is. Um, 
you have an idea about the what you want to communicate i remember the look on her face i describe it as shit face shock that's really kind of a cheat that's a little bit of a cheat you know but then the clutching the bouquet of long stemmed roses so it's technically a, a metaphor right because sometimes we can't maybe describe something but we can compare it to something that is uh, more familiar to other people um someone mentioned the billow of gypsum i was you know i had to sit down and think what happened first what happened second what happened third what happened fourth and and that's how i managed to reconstruct the story anything else that other images or uh, sensory details. I love the naked joists. The naked joists, yeah. It's a shock when you see your, when you see the, your ceiling blown open, you can see all the things that are part of your construction of your house. What else? Anything else? I really like the end, in a sense, almost the absence of a sensory image with the silence that it was absent of sound it, that the whole way you built up to that and what that held there that had a lot of power for me that whole way of describing the silence which was absence of a sensory thing was incredibly powerful thank you larissa um yeah you know and that's a that's a point about writing poems i mean for years and i have I have my notebook here so i can embarrass myself by showing you this is my notebook and I just have, um, in the back of my notebook, I keep keyword phrases of like memories that I've had. This is, you know, my notebook looks like, oh, this, is, this is gross, this is awful. Uh, my notebook looks like this, right? You know, it's just, sometimes it comes out in long prose lines, sometimes it comes more in, in lists and sometimes, you know, but in the back of my notebook, I keep a bunch of keyword phrases for just, memories that I've had, things that I've seen, things people say to me, things I, you know, notice that I think that I'm going to write about that. I don't know yet what it's going to be, but I'll put it in the back of my notebook. And then I would say that the word shotgun rode around in the back of my notebook for years, probably 10 years until one day, um, as Larissa, you know, sort of points out, I remember, it was a big family story we told. So, you know, it was easy to tell a story. But what I finally realized about it, that it could be a poem, was the moment when I thought about my mother and what she must have experienced at that moment. Because I was upstairs on the landing and I could see my sister and I could see she was fine and I was fine. But my mother was downstairs and that sec, you know, those microseconds what must have gone through her head and just that like realization was what eventually um caused me to realize it was a poem make it a poem so the story itself the anecdote was not quite enough for years and years and years but i kept it around because i knew it was valuable and it was only when i made that um, emotional connection to my mother and what she went through that it became a poem um and so i think maybe that's a lesson to all of you to think about being patient with with you the ideas you have um, maybe you have poems that are half finished maybe you have a notebook where there's bits and pieces of things they don't look like much but you know keep track of them keep them in a place where you can find them and they will eventually attract the other image or the other or the other memory or the other detail um, that that will um, make the poem happen. So, um, so I want to start with that poem because um, because I think I want to. What we're going to do today is is try to tell a story, maybe a story that you have told many times, and that that's going to be our prompt. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, maybe I'll stay with North Dakota, and and memories that stay with you for a long time and read this poem called Beating Up the Brother. Um, and this was a similar thing. I had, uh, I had a memory one morning. Uh, it came to me in, in an image and um, the image was, I, I could see my sister's 
my mom and dad, you know, we had one of those wax floors in our living room that was like so waxed and perfect that you could see the TV reflection in it, you know? And um, when my mom and dad would go to town, like for Saturday nights or something, um, we would have to be really careful not to scuff up that floor. So I have a memory of my three sisters standing in a circle in the living room and I can see the TV, TV glare. And then um, my brother is in the middle of the circle and my sisters are, let's see if I can move this out. My sisters are like this, they have their fists in the air. And my brother is like this. He's got his, <laughs> he's got his head covered like he's right in the middle of them. And I just got this like, just flash of an image. That's all I got. And when I, when I, when I got it, I thought, Oh my God, we used to, we must have beat my brother up. You know, I was the youngest. So I claim that I didn't do as much damage as my sisters did. But, um, but when, when I got that memory, then I tried to write a poem to answer the question, you know, why, why on earth did we do this? And um, my brother was just, is this just love, lovely, gentle man. Um, and so I wrote this poem, Beating Up the Brother. And you will hear this anaphora, this because I, and that was just the way I worked in my notebook. Because this, because that, because this. I'm just sort of throwing out theories about why we beat him up. Beating Up the Brother. Because he was a single stalk of sweet corn in a prairie of sisters. Because we were seven, nine, 11 and 12, and he was only 10, the middle one, the fulcrum our farm rested on. Because he was too cute and wore short pants, little hand in the cookie jar, little shrug and grin. Because his buzz cut felt like a freshly mowed lawn when we drove our hands over it. Because mom and dad left us alone on Saturday nights to watch the Ed Sullivan show or the Miss America pageant. Because no beauty from North Dakota ever won and that always made us mad or advanced to the final round of 10. Because we were a gaggle of girls expected to fly away and he would stay to plow the land after we were gone. Because he was the only boy sweet-natured and forgiving as Jesus under our fists because he was the brother, had that part we thought of as extra, that part we had never seen but knew existed. Okay, so um, are there any details from that poem that, <laughs> that um, jump out for you? Sheila, I see you're laughing. Thank you. <laughs> when I read that in grade schools, I don't read that last part about the, the phallic imagery. I just I just finish it with forgiving as Jesus under our fists, and that's that's it. For the fourth graders, that's all they need to know. They don't need to know the other part. Um, stock of, of sweet corn in a, in a prairie of sisters. Yeah, I was trying to come up with metaphors, and I think um, forget farming and animals yeah um and one of the for me one of the most fun one when i remembered what his buzz cut felt like because my mother would always give him the buzz cut and then we would like or like you know torment him by driving our hands over his his buzz cut um let's see any other good good um so you know, that's a, I think that's an exercise in um, answering questions. And uh, that scene actually made it into my memoir too, where I investigated even further. So that's the, maybe the other like little tip I can, ha I can give you is just because you've written about something once, it doesn't mean that you can't write about it again. And I find sometimes writing about something two times, three times, four times, it will actually get um, yeah, yeah, it will actually get 
new content coming in and new revelations. And sometimes, you know, you can go to your family or the people who, who know about the situation that you're writing about and ask them questions and they can actually give you more information. When I was working on my memoir, I was writing about the way that we used to work in the fields when we were little kids. And I, I thought I remembered that I first drove my tractor when I was 10. And uh, so, but I checked with my oldest sister, Colleen, and I said, no, I remember driving tractor when I was 10. And she was seven years older than me. So she, my mom had like kids every single year for a number of years. So she was just my oldest sister, but seven, seven years older. And she said, actually, the first time you drove a tractor, you were five. And I was like, oh my God, are you serious? And she said, yeah. She said, we would we'd go out to the field, we'd put you on the tractor. So it's five. She's like, they, we put you on the tractor. And, she's, and she said, I'd get the tractor in gear, put your hands on the wheel, and then, you know, just get the tractor going. And then I would jump off. And then she's like, you just be on the tractor, just, you know, steering. And then when they get to the end of the row, then she would jump back on the tractor, turn the tractor around and set me in place and, you know, and set the tractor going and then jump off again. And I mean, no wonder I don't remember it. Talk about meeting a psychiatrist, you know. Um, but it was, it was revelatory. You know, suddenly when she told me this, I could feel it in every cell of my body, this memory, but um, the act of actually bringing my family in as collaborators was really significant and, and meaningful. And I think I, I want to say that to you as writers to say um, so often we're kind of inside of this prism of silence when we're writing and perhaps worry about sharing with sharing it with people, but uh, a good way to go about doing this is to preemptively bring them in as collaborators and say, can you tell me what you remember about this? And, you know, what do you think about this? This is the way I remember it. And what will really surprise you is that they will have a completely different version of the story, probably. And then also, they will give you illuminating details that might change your story. So that's just a little kind of a little, a little tip. Oh my goodness. So um, what I'd like to do now is, is transition to this, um, this little exer exercise that I want you all to do. And it's called a, um, a story you've told a million times. Now, in order to illustrate a story you've told a million times, I'm going to tell you a little story about when I was a high school student. And this is about the, um, the first job I ever had. And um, I, we lived on a farm just two miles north of town, but I got a job at Maggie's Cafe in Napoleon, my hometown, as a waitress. So, you know, I'm getting ready for my first day of work. And I'm, so what I'm gonna try to do is give you a technique of using significant detail so I want you to think about, again, sight, smell, taste, touch, sound. Just try to work in details. So I'm going to try to fill my story with details. So I'm getting dressed and I've got this red uniform and it has like the white piping, you know, here, kind of the way the white piping in these uniforms. And I'm wearing these like cushy, white, kind of ugly, but comfortable white cushy shoes. And I'm really nervous because it's my first job. And But the really cool thing about it is my mom and dad are letting me drive their blue Chevy to town instead of normally it I'd, I'd have to drive the the pickup which was like always had like manure you know on the floor there was like you know from being in the fields and, and there was always a gas can in the back that would clang to the left and right when you would drive turn a corner today for the first time I got to drive my mom and dad's car it's a fairly new blue Chevy and I was really nervous and I decided I was going to steal one of my sister's cigarettes to just like have a couple puffs of that on the way into town because I thought that'll calm me down. So I get in my mom and dad's car and driving away on the gravel road so my mom and dad can't see me through the window. And I pop the lighter. Well, it's a virgin lighter. I mean, that lighter had never even been ignited before. You should have seen the ashtray. I mean, it was so pristine. It still had that gloss, that sort of factory gloss on it. So I'm like taking a couple puffs of the cigarette and I didn't like it at all. So I thought, I got to get rid of this. So I opened the window, cracked, threw the cigarette out, 
and turned the window back up, drove into town. And in Napoleon, uh, Maggie's Cafe was on this sort of main thoroughfare and right across the street was a big parking lot and all the elevators were right behind the parking lot. I parked my car and Maggie's had this big sort of picture window, floor to ceiling sort of front windows. So I parked my car, car across the street from Maggie's. I go in and, you know, a couple hours of training. I'm like making coffee, I'm working the cash register, I'm busting dishes, I'm putting orders in, you know, everything's going great. And then suddenly um, I start to notice that the, um, the tables, people are not at their tables and they're kind of like away from their tables and they're moving toward the front window. But I'm a professional, I'm not gonna be distracted by something, I'm busting dishes, I'm filling coffee cups. And then pretty soon there was nobody at the tables anymore and everyone was at the front windows looking out. So I sort of, you know, press, press up against the crowd. And by now it's, it's, it's night. So it's a bit dark and I can see above their heads, a sort of strobing red light. Right. I'm like, what is going on? So I get through the crowd and across the street. I see a fire engine. And beside my mom and dad's car, all four doors of my mom and dad's car thrown open and they are hosing down the inside of my mom and dad's car. And so I, you know, scream and run across the street and my car, my car, you know. And just as I get there, the fireman lifts something up and shows it to me. And what do you think it is? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> It's the cigarette, it's a cigarette butt. The entire back seat, the, all the, you know, like the whole seat is just burned out and it's all the way down to the electrical wiring, but they found that there was a cigarette butt. So you've all figured out exactly what happened. Um, when the cigarette was supposed to go out the window, it came back in and it went into the back seat and it smoldered there for hours. And um, this is a very long story and I'm not gonna bore you with everything that happened afterwards, but I wanna just, little postscript. The next morning, I was sleeping in my bed and um, I woke up and my mom was sitting on the edge of the bed watching me sleep. And I was like, oh my God, my mother never came into my bedroom like that. And there she was watching me sleep. And you know, I was raised a Catholic, so I was like ready to confess. So I'm like, mom. And she looks at me and she says, I know, honey, I know. Some hoodlum must have thrown a cigarette in the back seat of the car. And I said, yes, that must have been what happened. It was a hoodlum. <laughs> and I never told my mother um, what I had done. My father went to his grave, never knew that it was me. <laughs> so anyway, that's my story. So. Um, you want to tell me, uh, are there any particularly memorable details in that, in that story for you? I try to work in as many kind of specific and concrete details as possible. I feel like in the whole scene of where you worked, um, I could picture the entire thing, the uniform and everything else beyond that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and uh, and Judy says that the story was in my memoir. I did, I, I finally disclosed it and put it in my memoir. So I told the whole story on myself. <laughs> yeah. Ready to confess, yes. The virgin lighter, yeah. And my mother's use of the word hoodlum, I thought was so sweet. I mean, I didn't know, I'd never heard that word before, I'm sure before that Let's see okay so um are you all ready to do a little bit of writing okay now what i'm going to do is i'm going to share my screen so that i can just say a little bit about about free writing some of you are i think experienced writers and some might be just coming to this process so i'll do this quickly um okay so um
Okay, what makes good vivid writing? Sensory detail, specific and concrete, significant detail. So it's not only, you know, it's not only, you, you, you don't wanna just like throw everything on the page. I mean, when you're drafting, it's a good idea to just really, really put everything you can recall down. But there's a moment then when you're revising that you sort of select and you su select the significant detail so that your reader can kind of see what's important in all the details that you're throwing at them. Um, you know, try to work in images um, when possible, when you're tr especially trying to describe something that's very difficult to describe or perhaps so unique or specific to your perspective that it's hard. You can find something to compare it to using that me metaphor. And I think theme is important, but that's something you think about after you're done drafting and when you're working through, I think, revisions. Um, okay. So what we're gonna do today is, is do a free write. And I wanna just stress that there's no way to do it wrong. We'll start with the prompt and then you follow your imagination. Don't worry about spelling, punctuation, grammar. Uh, try to write in specific, you know, concrete sensory detail. Most importantly, keep the pen moving. If, you're, um, if, you, if, you, if the prompt doesn't bring you anything, just kind of keep the pen moving and your brain will get bored and it will give you something else. And then just follow that, okay? So here is the, um, here's the prompt. A story you've told a million times. Remember that crazy time when, uh, ellipsis, question mark, you must have a stash of stories that you're tempted to tell at parties or when you're sitting around with friends. Chances are these stories have stuck with you because there's something funny or something eerie or something very moving or something that remains hard to understand. Any of these qualities has to do with tension and tension is the element that makes us want to read on. So tell one of your tried and true stories, write it, write it for an anonymous reader. Um, so that's the prompt. Tell me a story that you've told a million times. I'm gonna make this smaller so that I can see you all. So I'll give you about, um, about 10 minutes or so, and then um, call you back and see if, if anybody feels like either sharing or just talking through the story. Okay, I will be quiet now.
Just a couple more minutes. Okay, just finish up that last um, thought so that you don't lose, lose it. And then we'll see what people came up with. Okay, um, so that wasn't very much time and maybe you only got a little start, um, but does anyone feel like um, just sharing either just reading a couple phrases or a couple parts of what you wrote or just talking about the story that you remembered that you were writing about? Yes, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> You're my plant. You're like <laughs> of course. Started off. Started uh, I was off. mostly didn't quite get to the story, but was mostly writing details from just a time when I was a teenager and me and friends decided to make the biggest marshmallow we could ever make. And 
tried to yeah. melt marshmallows to make it and it didn't quite work and we ended up with a monstrosity that we floated on uh uh empty two liter bottles probably of mountain dew that we drank that day and floated it in the uh central park mall lagoon in omaha so it was it just like mashed like just a mash puff of yeah, it was it wasn't puffy at all. It was just this kind of large bucket sized hard marshmallow <laughs> mass uh floating on a boat and we left a note with it and I was trying to remember details from the note and yeah. So the did the water and floating it come into play when you realized that you weren't gonna accomplish the largest mar marshmallow in the <laughs> world? And then you were like, I know, let's just put it on the water, you know. That, yeah, it was just kind of like we we were making it without a real plan, except we were supposed to hit somebody over the head with it, but it would have <laughs> actually hurt them, we figured. So um, we abandoned it with a note that you would put on an abandoned child left somewhere, kind of Moses-like. Um, so, yeah. And I suspect that the people, who are the, who are the people who comprise the we in your the, story? Yeah, me and three friends uh, from my high school days. So. And are they Im important in, in other stories as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the way, you know, like if you start to mine these stories, they, they've got all these, um, you know, strings that attach to other stories. I'm all for like finding multi multiplying subjects in my work. <laughs> anybody else it willing to talk about um either what they wrote or a story that they got amy you want to go yeah thank you i can uh, only see one screen so there might be people um so oh go ahead amy yeah um and i have told this a thousand times um it was a first date with someone i actually dreamt about before he asked me out I wanted to impress him with glittering conversation. Then on the way home, for no good reason, as we were driving past Robert's Dairy, a large plant near the campus, I said out loud, I've always wondered where they keep all the cows. He almost ran the car off the road. You're kidding, right? I wasn't, but quickly realized there weren't any cows. And he explained to me how milk got from the farms to the dairy for bottling as if to a child on a grade school field trip. <laughs> ah, that's great. So um, I love that phrase glittering, con glittering conversation. It's such a great word. And then we have the contrasting not so glittering um, <laughs> statement, which is I wonder, always wondered where they keep all the cows. And did you say, was it Roberts? What was yeah. the name? Roberts. It's a nice specific, and you had the, the geographic detail about the campus and the road going around. And um, and then I like that metaphor um, at the end, um, as if to explain, what was that? Well, to a child on a grade school field trip. <laughs> I mean, I was in college when I said this, so. <laughs> yeah. I was telling a class the other day that the one of the best lines I ever got was at a dinner conversation. I don't know what we were talking about, but I said, I still don't believe I said this. I said, oh, I've castrated. And I proceeded to tell a story about how we used to castrate, you know, um, bull calves on the farm. And I was like, never invited to that place ever again for dinner. Um, but it became part of my memoir. I wrote a whole big section about, you know, um, cast castrating and things like that. So you never know when that good line will come. Um, let's see, anybody else wanna, wanna go? <clears throat> Let's just ask the question. Uh, Deborah, <clears throat> do you write differently if you're writing just a paper copy or if you're if it's a write, writing something for oral presentation? Um, I think, yeah, I do. I do write differently. Um, and when I'm doing oral presentations, you mean like a more professional setting? Right, um, right. You know, I work a lot in PowerPoint, actually. It's, it seems kind of, kind of crazy, but I find, um, 
you know, I have a, a, a highly associative mind because I'm a poet. And so my mind is always kind of going off in lots of different directions. And so when I have to give a, a talk of some kind, it helps me to have put a PowerPoint together earlier because it forces me to think in a more kind of organized way because you have to go screen by screen by screen. And so, yeah, I do write differently. Um, for my creative work, I usually start in, in, in my notebook and I just throw stuff in there. And then, um, then, I, then when I, I go through and I kind of mine that notebook and I find things, I think, okay, this looks pretty good. I'm gonna start working on this, like say for a deadline or something, then I'll open up a, you know, like a, a word file and start typing it in. And then from there on out, I don't really write by hand anymore. I, I work on the computer, but that's a process I've worked out um, over the years that works. And I was going to also recommend um, to all of you this, you know, sort of free writing exercise. You can actually make this part of your regular uh, daily or, you know, weekly routine. Um, I bought these little candles from a, like, it's kind of like a head shop in, in Ames. It's, you know, they sell like pipes and incense and stuff like that. Um, and they, they, they just have these tiny little candles. I think they're meditation candles but I, I'll burn one of those and they burn for about 15 minutes. And so I'll just put that on my desk, you know, start it up, start the candle and then just free write for the duration of that candle. And I don't even look up until I hear, until I smell the wick. Um, you know, the, that smell when the wick extinguishes itself in the wax. And then when I smell that, then I know, okay, I'm done for the day. And, you know, you have to establish these little, um, these little rituals in order to get yourself, you know, set up in a routine for writing. Let's see now, someone is saying, Lenora says, I'm going, going to town in the backseat of my brother's car to get root beer at the A&W, passing an old farmhouse when a man had hung himself, year, where a man had hung himself years earlier. Wow, what an incredible memory. I mean, you know, that's really, that's really about um, trauma and the way that trauma lives in the body um, beyond um, the actual, you know, even, even if someone didn't observe it to just know that, you know, that's just, that's incredible memory. Oh my God. Let's see, uh, Tracy says, I've been trying to write one of my friends from, Boy, from Boys Town. This prompt reminded me of a great story that involves a saw, which was given to given me an angle to write it down. A warm angle, that's that's good, thanks. Let's see. Oh, Annie says, I, I found a mother load here. This is what everybody's doing. They're not talking to me, they're just writing to me. Okay, I always tend to go deep when I write and start broad. I think that's okay. Um, um, you know, there's no rules for how to, how to start. Every writer has actually a different process and you have to learn yours and honor it. Um, but my first year of college experience, I narrowed it down to panic attacks. I ended up having an exploring sensory. Yeah, I'd like to break down my larger stories into smaller ones to focus on images, senses, etc. I think, Annie, that's such a good strategy um, because as you say, this is a big subject. Um, and also I think whenever one writes about trauma, and I'm thinking about the other one that I read the memory, um, you know, you have to focus on something very specific um and and that will bring if you have that very specific detail and and just get that in there and sort of you know just well up around that right around that right around it you know then the whole the whole thing will come will come out so you don't have to write the whole thing the the image as it is true for all all of our creative writing the images and the details they do the work i always say they're like have you ever seen ants on a food trail have you ever seen an ant carrying a crumb that's like about five times bigger than its body just carrying it along and i think that's the way details are they do so much lifting for us so you'll find when you start um, working through your drafts you can eliminate a lot of language and a lot of clutter just by you know, finding the images and then building the images up so that they rise in the profile of, of the piece. Let's see, oh my goodness. A road trip to, New Heidi says a road trip to New Mexico 
or I missed my exit and came across a holy man disguised as a park ranger. I want to hear that story. Where's Heidi? <laughs> Heidi, don't you want to tell us that story? I don't see Heidi. Okay, we're almost I have, to, I have to do a better job of putting it together and then I'll tell you, I promise. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, Rose Jorgensen would like to, would be willing to share her charcoal chicken story. Don't you want to hear that? I do. Where's Rose? I'm here. I'm okay. My dad. <laughs> oh, you're going to make fun of your dad through poetry? Yes. So it's just a fun pastime for a while. Still, and... This happened years ago and we still make fun of him for it. So what happened, Rose? Do you want to just... I'll just, I'll just read it, I guess. It's not too, it's super long. Seven o'clock, chicken in the oven. The smell of Indian spices fills the kitchen with dirt brown walls. All is quiet. A new smell enters the air. The smell of smoke and burnt food. The smoke alarm pierces the silence, making me jump out of the dark blue recliner. I'm only eight years old, but I know that sound means danger. My sister on the couch, staring towards the chicken in horror. Her tandoori chicken, her favorite meal, what happened to it? <laughs> my father shuts off the alarm as my mother opens the oven. The only light is from the hallway and the red hot metal tray. An oven mitt slides onto my mother's hand, green contrasting against what used to be red chicken. My dad couldn't tell anyway, he's colorblind. Her hand, hidden by the mitt, reaches in and lifts the glass lid of the crock pot. It sags, folding in on itself, as if the glass was turned into a wet towel. My mother only has a moment to comprehend what's happening before the glass shatters. It mimics her heart, breaking into pieces that fall into the coal black chicken. The chicken looked as if it could be used as coal for a fire if only my family wasn't cursed by asthma. My sister wanted to eat it anyway. She always loved burnt food. My father, <laughs> confused, looks at the oven dial. He hadn't turned it to bake like he thought he had. The arrow pointed menacingly at that five-letter word, broil, the hottest setting. Burnt chicken mocking my mother's burning gaze. The chicken, glass and all, is thrown into the tall silver trash can. Despite attempts to suppress myself, I begin to laugh as loud as the screeching smoke alarm did just a few minutes before. The crock pot is without a lid, and my sister is without tandoori chicken. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Rose, for reading that. Well, I was trying to I was trying to write down and grab some of the like really stellar details, but then I realized I was just transcribing the entire piece. So, um, but you know, um, a new smell enters the kitchen. Um, I like the way you started with seven seven o'clock. You had the you had the time. You started with the time, and then there's this, um, the, there was that one part about the light from the hallway. You could see the light from the hallway. Uh, the glass shatters and then my mother's heart shatters with it or something like that and um, the sound of the alarm being the sound that means danger the narrator says i'm only seven or five i can't remember eight was eight, eight. Years old ago. yeah eight but um i know that means danger this dark was it a dark gray recliner dark blue dark blue recliner there's so much detail wow was great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think, are we out of time, Matt? We are hitting it. Yes. Okay. Anything to close things down? Um, well, I would, uh, let's see, Pam says she has waited with fear of decades and hundreds of excess pizza, potatoes and cheese that exploded her body trying to consume the insecurities and self acceptance. Now was the time to swallow that fear. She took a big bite and entered her gym and joy of breathing and self acceptance. Better than a pizza any day, that's great. Um, and Rose says, I love that Pam. And Heidi says, thanks for the prompt. I really appreciate all of you, all of you being willing Oh, wait, there's one new message. And then I want to tell you one more thing before I let you go. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Rose. So um, maybe you know about this book, but I recommend it to you. It's called, um, maybe uh, two books. Okay. Uh, Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. If you haven't seen this book, I really love this book. I'm going to put it in here. Um, and it's, it's a sort of a program that you can use to get yourself writing. And the nice thing about it, 
the nice thing about it is she's got this thing called morning pages where you just roll out of bed and you put three pages down. You don't think about anything. You, you know, you don't judge it. You just put it down. And to get that practice going, I think really helps a lot. You probably rarely, you will never show anybody your morning pages, but they will be good. They will create fodder uh, for, for good, for good writing. And then the last one I want to share with you book recommendation is Robert Haas's um, a little book on form and for those of you who are uh, primarily poets and um this is this is an amazing book by robert haas where he um he goes but you know if you're not a formalist don't worry because he talks about elegies and odes and he does talk about more what we think of as traditional forms like um sonnets and pantoums and villanelles but it's 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 almost like a a study course because every chapter where he writes say for example about the about the pantoum then he'll say here are examples he'll say look look for this look for that read this read that so it's like having like a super informed friend who's constantly feeding you good tips about you know ways to find more poems and techniques and i'm actually doing that book this summer and i'm just really loving it just working my way through it slowly having this conversation with robert Hass, one of the best American poets that we have. So those are my recommend recommendations. Oh, uh, James says, thanks for, I'm doing Artist Way online right now. Oh, I didn't realize it's online. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody. This has been so great. And um, I appreciate your willingness to indulge me and go along. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. Um, this is great. We, we'll be putting a, a video on YouTube of this workshop. Um, I'll send an email to everybody who registered for today, as well as information about uh, the next series, which is every Friday in July. Um, you can see it uh, as an event on our Facebook, Nebraska Writers Collective, um, but I'll also send an email or feel free to contact me. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming. Uh, have a, a fantastic afternoon. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Be Peace. safe. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Don't forget your mask. <laughs> <laughs>